Hello and welcome to Transmission. Tonight I am joined by Jez. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so having a bit of a discussion before and you said that um, you've actually got two children. Yeah. Um, how, how old are your kids? Yeah, so I've got twins. They're yeah. just about to turn two and um, that's been an interesting journey. Mm. So yeah, I have a female partner. We're in an open relationship. And uh, yes, yeah, she really wanted to have children, mm -hmm. and we were totally shocked when it was twins. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. But I've found because you know, uh, I'm trans. I'm a trans man. That um, my life is very complex, and I occupy a lot of different spaces. Mm -hmm. And people think that I am something or a certain something, depending on the space I'm in, yeah. and they might not get the whole picture to me. So. Even having kids as a trans man, as a queer man, say if I'm at the, like the Laird or Circa or something, and um, I'm talking to a guy, and uh, I, you know, feel like I need to be honest and say, you know, you know, I've got kids, blah blah blah, and some of them will just like whoosh, totally like turn around and, yeah. and walk away. Or um, so I have found it interesting to be like a queer trans man who has a family, yeah. but also is quite active in like the queer men's community. Yeah, so yeah. is that sort of, there's that sense that you're sort of having to come out in different ways depending on yeah. the, where you are. Yeah, and I mean it happened, you know, firstly when I came out as queer before I was trans and then I came out as trans when I was queer and I guess again now coming out as a queer trans man it's like the third time and then now I've got kids so it's like I'm coming out <laughs> as being a family man. Yep. Uh, it's sort of never ending but um, how I feel now about it is I'm really glad that I have to like declare so much to people that might be a potential partner or a lover or, mm -hmm. or someone or someone whom I might be intimate with because if their politics and who they are kind of can't handle that, then that really works for me because it means that I don't have to pursue it any further. So it's kind of a screening yeah. tool as much as anything. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel as though, because is there sort of a certain time in a conversation where you will broach that, that, you know, sort of happening to come out? Yeah, well, this is the thing that I've found difficult to navigate. At first, I was like, you know, how much do I tell them when, what's appropriate? Um, so I certainly, if the environment is, if I'm just out having a laugh, having a few drinks with friends at, at, at bars and meeting strangers, I would just be natural myself that night and just be, you know, talking about whatever. If something were to move to a stage where, you know, I might like to see that person or go on a date or we might hook up, then um, I would probably declare that, yeah, I have a partner mm -hmm. um, and that um, I'm trans. <clears throat> so there's a few conversations going on there. The partner thing is not su such a big deal. You just talk about open relationship. That's not unfamiliar for a lot of mm. queer people. Um, uh, but the trans thing is, is also an important thing mm. to talk about, you know, in terms of safety and disclosure. Yeah. So yeah. Um, have you sort of had generally, what sort of the reactions do you get? Do you sort of get any you know, anything's possible, so positive, negative, all yeah. between? Yeah, mostly positive. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, there's been some situations where I've had to explain in more detail than other times about what trans means, and um, I like to be, like, really honest about that and what that means for my body and what that would mean when we are having sex or what kind of sex we'd be having. And just because it saves everyone time and it's also you know, that can be a fun, playful, flirtatious thing as yeah. well. So um, I don't mind doing that. Um, but, yeah, in terms of declaring, you know, that with people and talking about that I'm trans, there's so surely been some negative responses, but it's not never been offensive. Mm -hmm. It's been, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm not really into that. Yeah. And, we, you know, I could be rejected for a whole load of reasons. I'm not going to get upset about that, like, mm. you know... Um, I, I, so yeah, it's there's a it's a mixed bag, but yeah, more positive than negative. Yeah. yeah. You, do you find that so? I mean, having small children and stuff, you um, are you mixing with sort of different groups in terms of so not necessarily within the queer community. Um, and then do you find that 
are you sort of coming out as trans in those sort of other spaces? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no. So obviously my kids are only around two, so they don't understand that concept yet. But when they do, we'll be talking to them. Um, the families that we come into contact with, you know, I, I don't talk about me being trans. To me, I'm just their dad. And to, to these people, I'm just their dad. Mm. Um, but what I'm finding is that just through our, you know, osmosis and through our friendship circles, even if there are people that we are friends with that are in a straight family situation, they're still really queer-minded. They have lots of queer friends that either end up hearing about who I am anyway or, you know, will read an article or something. Um, so it's never, never been a big deal. Mm. Um, and they just accept me for who I am and, and they love me for who I am. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure that there will be some cases down the track mm. that it will be a bit tricky. <laughs> have, you, have you thought about how you're going to bring it up with your children when they're sort of old enough to, I guess, start to grasp concepts? Yeah, I have. And I think I'll do more research on that. But I think what I'll do is, um, you know, I, I don't think that we should have any body shame um, in terms of, you know, how I feel about myself and that's an ideal and a value that I want to, you know, put into my family. Mm. Um, that, you know, being comfortable, being nude or, you know, having showers together seems really normal and natural to me. So, you know, in terms of our bodies all being, you know, available to each other, you know, to be able to see what, what that is and it to be normalised in that context is healthy. Mm. But I think, you know, when they get to a certain age and if they're picking up with a certain amount of language, I'll explain that, you know, Babies are, are born um, differently, and sometimes when people grow up, they feel like they actually want to become a boy or a girl or something else, or they don't feel so attached to being a boy or a girl. And I'll explain that, you know, you know I was a, a girl and, and now I'm a boy. And just in really simple language, I imagine. Yeah. Um, so it's almost similar to sort of, I suppose, people get concerned talking to, the, to, talking to children about being gay and that sort of stuff. And it's yeah. similar that kids generally kind of don't really care. Yeah. Like, it's just, oh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, the, the donor that we used is a close friend who's gay and has a, you know, a male partner. So they're, you know, a relationship as well around us. And our kids are already going when they see cartoons and animals kissing, whatever. They go, mummy, daddy, kissing. You know, so then, then I say, you know, um, our friends' names, mm. you know, I say their names and go kissing, you know, so I, I'm already laying the land out for them that there are alternative relationships yeah. and alternative genders, you know, having relationships. So they'll be informed that the world is like diverse. So yeah. I think they'll be super little children. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm sure there'll be challenging moments at school or, yeah. you know. Um, that, that's kind of cool. I'm just picturing these like these kids that just know sort of everything about queerness, and they're just I like, know. Totally. It's kind of cool. It's really, yeah. really cool. With sort of when you are, will be speaking to sort of with your kids, do you think that they're going to be there's going to be issues in terms of when they do go to school and turn, talking to their friends and all that sort of stuff? I just imagine because kids can be a bit rough. If they if there's a kid that knows, they could just tease them. I imagine the worst case scenario would be that they would be teased that their dad is something or this or that but we'll just be you know encouraging them to not feel ashamed of anything mm. um, and teach them around how to stand up for their rights and mm. how to you know not worry about people and what their views are yeah. so um, yeah it's really all you can do yeah and it could come up about any topic yeah yeah look ha thank you so much for coming on and having a very brief um, <laughs> discussion um, and yeah, so and for sharing your story, so thank you very much. So you've been watching uh, Transmission. Hi, you're watching Transmission. Buck Angel is the most famous transgender porn star. What the hell does that mean? Find out more. Uh, you're with Sammy Cameron on Bent TV, and I am with Buck Angel. Hey, Buck, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some physical bits and pieces and mental bits and pieces about transitioning. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was testosterone. What does that do to your body? When you take testosterone, what does it do to you? 
Well, I mean, for myself uh, specifically, it, it started to actually change physically my body. And uh, I work out in the gym, so I was able to sort of put muscle mass on. And it actually made – I used to be 110 pounds, and now I'm 150 pounds. So it did put a lot of mass on my body. Uh, hair growth started to happen. Uh, hair loss by the looks of it. Hair thing. loss, most definitely, thank God. I'm actually love being bald. <laughs> I love my long hair. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> you and I are different like that. <laughs> it's actually changed the structure of my face. Uh, my nose grew differently. I mean, lots of my voice changed. Um, all these different kinds of things that happened to me. Oh, okay. Mentally, I changed as well. Okay, I'll get back to that. But what's over what period of time did the physical changes happen? They started happening pretty quickly. I would say within the first two or three months. I mean, I could start to see, feel. I sort of morphed. It was weird. Like I, there was a stage there within the first year where I was looking kind of weird because it was like your body's like morphing. It's very bizarre what happened. At what age were you when you started taking testosterone? I was 28 years old. Okay, so your body had kind of like gone through all yes. the developments and now it was having to do something different. Tell me about uh, what it did to your mind. How did it change your mind? Well, I actually became a much calmer person. Uh, people think that uh, testosterone makes you angry. and that, No, no, no. I used to be angry way before I took testosterone. And I took testosterone. It sort of leveled me out. And I started having clarity in the way that I thought about things and the way that I approached things. And my mind just felt at ease, if that makes sense. Like I just felt like I could communicate with the world where before I was always like, rah, rah, there's something wrong with me. Did you think that before you took testosterone that because your hormone levels were changing on a regular basis and now they were settled? Well, no, I think that because I wasn't supposed to have estrogen in my body and I only had estrogen in my body and I felt like a, a man, so I was fighting that. So I think the testosterone was something that my body needed. So when it came in, it just... <laughs> It just sort of like calmed me down. It really was something that still to this day when I, when I, sh I um, inject testosterone, but when the testosterone sort of when I inject it and it starts to level out like that, I can feel, I feel different. I feel totally different, yes. So after you've had your, your hit, yes. that's the best time. It's the best time for sure. Yeah. And you, t you take, uh, how often do you take? Uh... Well, now I, sh I inject myself between every seven to 10 days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about top surgery. How long ago did you do that? Wow, I did that two years into my uh, my change. So it was pretty so quick so after, yeah, oh, it was a long time ago. Although you can get it done pretty quickly these days with a letter from a, a psychiatrist. I mean, I could have probably done it, but it was, um, I wanted to find a surgeon, a specific surgeon, and when I did it, there were no, no trans men really back then, and there was no yeah. doctor specifically doing trans surgery. So I had to find a doctor that I felt, I wanted to find a specific kind of surgery. And so after about 10 different doctors who kept telling me they were just going to cut it off and I was like no I don't that's not what I want I found a specific doctor and he was willing to kind of work with me and do the job and he never worked with a trans man before so yeah. so, so you so you had a, like a custom well yeah and I had to save a lot of money yeah because you know nobody paid for it I had to pay for it on my own so yeah. I worked two jobs and I saved for two years and then I yeah. got my surgery and uh and how long did it take to sort of physically recover from that? It was actually a long time because I was sober at the, I'm still sober, but I was, just had gotten sober. So the drugs that they give you and all that, and then the pain, it took about, I'd say six months for me to fully recover from that. And what about, what was the effect on your head? Well, my whole life changed. After that, I was just like, whoa, like, yeah, because I wanted to take my shirt off and I could start doing those kind of things. I mean, just the simple thing of taking your shirt off. Walking around in public without your shirt A lot of your cisgender men yeah. take for granted, but, yeah. you know, it was something that I always wanted to do. And so, yeah, that was, like, huge for me to be able to just – because that's why now all you see is pictures of me topless because <laughs> I love taking my shirt off. <laughs> uh, tell me about some health and nutrition tips. So you look after yourself. Yes, you go to the gym regularly, yeah. even when you're traveling. Even when I'm traveling. Yeah, so – and food, do you have like a special – Yeah, I, I stopped program? eating meat and I stopped eating chicken and I'm, I don't eat any gluten – and I eat a huge amount of vegetables and protein and a lot of fish and a lot of eggs. And I don't eat really any junk food at all. I don't drink any soda pop. I, my, I guess my vice is coffee. I don't eat any alcohol. I'm re I have a very, very clean, healthy diet. And I think that has really helped me a lot. Um, I want to talk quickly about dating. 
So why you want a date? I can't. I have can, a girlfriend. Well, you know, I'm, I don't know. I mean, you're a lovely guy, and I'd love to be <laughs> hard, but I'm into, I'm into chicks. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, okay, well, I'm I have a, a sexist so. like that. You get a girlfriend. I don't want to go out on a date with you. But if you were, when you, well, I mean, you know, when you're going out, if you are going out on a date, you know, um, you know, when when you tell people that this, you know, you know that there's something different about you. I mean, you're different because lots of people know you, but there's still places you can go that people don't know you. And if you're going out on like a blind date, uh-huh. you know, how do you deal with that kind of thing? Well, I mean, that's a whole other disclosure is an, a big thing for me. I'm very much, but disclosure comes when you choose to disclose, and I do think you should disclose. Only when it comes down to if it's going to be something where you have to take your clothes off. Um, who need, no one needs to know at that at the point if you're going to have coffee. Who cares? What does that have to do with anything? You're just who you are. But I think eh, you need to disclose if there's going to be some kind of sexual contact because that person might be, you know, when they see me, they might just be expecting that I have a penis and I don't have a penis. And so when I go to have sex with somebody and that's what they're expecting, I don't think that that's appropriate behavior. I think that I need to say, look, well, actually, you know, this is who I am and this is what I have. And I think it empowers myself as well it's respectful for the other person. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess like this, you know, the straight trans women, I'll see if I get my terminology right, the straight right. trans women who are dating a man, uh-huh. I guess if you're a, if you're a gay trans man gay, uh, dating uh-huh. another man, that's when it can get a little bit dangerous. Well, even if I'm dating a woman and she doesn't even know, you know what I mean? It's like she might be into the fact that I have a vagina, but maybe she's not. Maybe yeah. she really wants me to have a penis. Yeah. And so when I don't have the penis, it's... How would you, really, how would you feel about that? Would you feel okay if all of a sudden you were going home with somebody and then they, you wanted a penis and they didn't have it? You're probably asking the wrong chick. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's not okay to do that. It's not okay. Many people don't like me saying that, but I, it's my opinion. I do believe in disclosure. Yeah, so it's got to be disclosure, but at the right time. You don't have to tell At everybody. the right time. I'm not saying we're going to have coffee. Oh, but by the way, I have a vagina. Before we have a cup of coffee, I just want you to know I have a vagina. Are you okay with that? Like, I really think that I'm going to try that on my next day. <laughs> I reckon that sounds like such a great line. <laughs> Just in case anyone should know. Just in case. Yeah, I think it's great. It's great. <laughs> um, all right, Buck, look, thank you so much. It's uh, great that you've come over to Australia. And uh, we're really pleased that uh, we've had the opportunity to chat with you and Thanks. get a little bit of your positivity and, and uh, happiness. Thank you. Uh, you've been listening to Sammy on uh, Bent TV, and I've been with Buck Angel. You thought your life was complicated. There's more transmission after this short break. Welcome to Transmission on Bent TV. I'm Sammy Cameron, and today we're talking about the law and our rights. Joining me today are Dale. G'day. Bernice. Hi, how are you? And Amy. Hello, how are we? Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. So I wanted to just start talking about our experiences with the law and the police, any personal experiences that we might have had. <laughs> well, I got arrested when I was 18, put in the back of a divvy van, the one and only time that I've ever been in the back of a divvy van. Um, and it was my fault and I claim responsibility for that, but um, I think the police actually do a pretty reasonable job with um, how they manage us on the whole. Um, they have um, pretty ordinary laws and so forth, but uh, generally speaking, I think if you put something out there and you behave yourself and, and let the police do their job, um, then you don't get treated too badly. Your, your experience was a long time ago. So it was think, a so long time ago. So I think things have changed, <laughs> changed a bit now. So Yes and no, I still think female to male transsexuals are still vulnerable, um, especially pre-T. They're a bit vulnerable. Uh, they might be telling the police officer, look, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, and uh, be taken as a, a girl. Um, and a little bit of attitude, maybe, mm. from them um, would get their police back up. Um, you know, I, I've got rights and this and that. Um, goes a long way to stirring up the police. But I, I still think F2Ms are a little bit vulnerable to, to police. Uh, but we're learning, the police are learning that not all female looking people are female and not all male looking people are male. Yeah, they're, so. they're slowly learning and it's, it's come along, we've got laws. Yeah. And, um, the, and the police have now got procedures in place to deal with these, these sorts of issues now too. That's right, yes. I'm, I'm a, an actual serving member of Victoria Police. I've been in uh, the job for 10 years. Um, initially my experience with police as, as a young person was fairly good. I always had respect for police. I think that's uh, the key, isn't it? It is, respect. yeah, and we were scared of them, basically, because <laughs> we knew that we made a mistake, you know. We not only had 
do we have to deal with um, the police? We have to deal with our parents. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you got, so you got in trouble at an early age in life then? Well, I never really got into trouble, but I had a respect. So I thought I don't really need to know how they operate to find out. So, um, um, And since I've joined the police, um, they've been very supportive uh, of myself. Um, I got in on my merits. Uh, there was no special treatment. Um, and I've enjoyed um, generally the, the structures set up for anyone who wants to join, regardless of race, gender identity, sexuality, religion, whatever. So, which is a great thing. So, um, and, and you were the first, um, you're the first serving police officer to be transgender in the Victorian as police. As far race. as I know, yes. And I joined back in 2004. Okay. Um, so under the then uh, Chief Commissioner Christine Nixon, yeah. who I found very supportive, um, and she gave me my what we call our Freddie, our badge. So, <laughs> so she presented me with that, and um, yeah, no, she was she was good. So um, look, you know, members always have different points of view about different people. Um, you know, it was a bit of a, a rocky road with all the media coverage at the start. Um, Fit for you. Yeah. So and a lot of the information that they had there wasn't. Uh, accurate anyway, but um, that's all right. You know, you you, you just think, well, I got to do what I got to do, and I just go and do it. So, but I've, I'm, well, members I've worked with, they enjoy working with me, um, and they know that I've got their back, and I and I know they've got mine. So it's good. I suppose you're in a position we don't really need to talk about it with people. It's just like no, just look. I mean, I've, I've gone to some jobs, you know, and you always get someone who's, are you a man or a woman? And I just, I know, I'll just say something. I'll just say I'm transgender. You know, what's the issue? You know, I'll just, I mean, I'll just say it. You know, I'm not going to say, um, you know, because sometimes I feel like saying, I am your worst <laughs> if an enemy. <laughs> don't cross me, David. Uh, I'm up front, and if they want to go on with all their, you know, negativity, fine, I don't care, you know. Um, yeah. If, if you're arrested uh, mm. and, and the police need to search you yeah. um, and they look at your licence and they look at you and they can't see, they, they think there's a mismatch between gender, what do they do? Under the legislation, if a person identifies as either male or female, even though their bi biological sex uh, states differently, they are to be treated in the desired gender role. So it's a matter of the person who's been arrested gets to choose, this is the gender that I am, well, or I want you to, take, to treat me as... Well, I suppose the word choose is probably not something we choose, you oh, know. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so, but look, yeah. if a person says to, uh, like Dale was saying earlier, if they say, I'm a, a boy and um, I may look like a girl, but I'm a boy, or I may not look like a girl, but I'm a boy, you know what I mean? We have to go with that and say, right, this person. So we would ask, are you a transgender person? Yes, I am. Okay. Then we would have to implement um, a person who they feel comfortable with to conduct the search. And w when we're talking about searches, a general pat-down search on the street is generally just done by uh, a member of the same gender or same sex. Uh, but if it's a more intrusive search that is required because the person's in custody and is brought back to a cell and we need to conduct a, a full search, which involves... Um, not only a pat down but an intrusive search. We have to get permission from a, a senior senior officer, and also that has to be done either uh, through uh, a doctor or a person qualified of the same gender. Okay. So the, the, look, we're not there to intimidate or um, uh, scare people. Although I know in the past, yes, the, the history has not been been that good. And I remember a member saying to me. Um, uh, when I was when I was a constable back in 2004, um, you know, if you had a join back in the 80s, we would have built the crap out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, gee, just as well I didn't join in the yeah, 80s. Yeah, definitely. 80s were wild yeah. times. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, and these are coppers, you know, so, um, but things have changed, thank God. So, but look, there's always going to be a mentality in some members' minds that we're all, you know, a bit different and odd and all the rest of it. But I think, thank God, you know, Things are changing and people are starting to realise that we are real people. And I think that's very true. Yeah. We have changed so much. I, I've you, you transitioned know. in the last four or five years. And, and, and you're in the Air Force? I'm in the Air Force. Yeah. But what I noticed more than anything else is the public has transitioned with me. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I was able to transition is because the world was right. Generally speaking, the laws started to change, public perception started to change. Royal Children's Hospital, one of the most conservative establishments in the country, started supporting transgender children. You, know, you have a whole range of 
changes that came through that support the law reform. Mm. Do we know anything about how many transgender people have find themselves in jail or anything like that? I've, I know of one guy who just can't keep out of jail in New South Wales uh, and they lodge him at Silverwater. Lodging is the right word, I think. Lodging, <laughs> lodging yes. Uh, and he's a habitual criminal and drug addict. It's a shame. Mm. Um, the system tries to um, uh, really try hard. They... When he first got into trouble back in the 80s, uh, they just said, right, you'll go here, here and here. But now in the enlightened age, they're trying to say, look, the dysphoria, we want to put you in silver water with the women and you have to work halfway with us. If, if, with all things, you have to work halfway. If I got in trouble tomorrow, I'd probably end up at Deer Park, mm -hmm. but I'd work with the authorities. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you so much for um, speaking with us today. Thank you to Dale, Bernice and Amy. I'm Sammy Cameron on Transmission with Bent TV. Thank you for watching us today and see you next time.